morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day, and I am so excited to be joining you with my colleagues for the second in our four-part live webinar series on historical argumentation. So we are going to talk so a little more historical thinking skills. So we kind of think big picture. The first uh, the first live program and in the first module of the class we looked at breaking down and understanding individual primary sources. Well we're going to start the process of putting this together. So let's start by just a couple little housekeeping items just to have you kind of on the same page with us. Just like you did if you joined us early, that Q&A box is key. Go ahead and click that Q&A box, put your questions in. If you have a question for Christopher or for myself, pop it in there. Um, Ashley will be in charge of the question box, so you'll be able to see more of the questions coming in this time, and she'll interrupt if there's a really good one, and we'll do like we did last time. We will stick around and answer questions at the end. Keep in mind, you've got to do the survey at the end in order to get your attendance credit. We'll pop it up when we go to Q&A, just like we did last time. The video and the slides will post to Schoology. Our goal is to get them up by 5 p.m. Eastern. And I'll give you a little add-on. We're also adding bibliographies. We added one to the, as it was actually a request by somebody in the class. So we added it into webinar one in, in the folders in Schoology, and we're gonna add it on to number two today. I just have to finish editing the last three, but it'll be done by five o'clock today, I promise. Little reminder, what's coming up? Your historical analysis assignment. It's due via Schoology, just like you did the last time, at noon Eastern time this Friday. So what does that involve? A revised thesis. Take your feedback. Those discussion boards have been exploding and hopping. There's lots of good, um, lots of good suggestions, lots of good ideas being put out there. Take the best of them, make your revisions. Then you're gonna choose two Library of Congress temperance sources. You are allowed to choose the one that you use for your module assignment. You don't have to use the one. You can choose two from the packet. You can also choose one from the packet and one from the library that you go find or two from the library. The key is you have to provide those URLs though so your facilitators can look at them and see what you're trying to compare. Your response is one paragraph. Let me be clear, that is one paragraph. That is not three pages. That is not a thousand words. One paragraph. So think about it, if you're a double spacer, no more than a page. Preferably more like half a page, three quarters of a page. If you're a single spacer, tighten up, quarter page, half a page max. And I want you to use a writing strategy with this. Highlight the key words and phrases that show that you're using hindsight, agency, or perspective. We are not asking for all three here. I don't know that you can do that in a paragraph. But highlight those key words and phrases so it's really clear to your facilitator what you're trying to do. Module three will launch on Friday. You'll get an email when it's live. All right, those are the housekeeping details. I'm gonna turn my camera off and turn things over to Christopher to kick us off today. Thank you so much, Lynn, and it's great to see everybody. Um, it's great to have everybody back. Thank you so much for the really useful feedback that you gave in the survey last time. We take that really seriously. Um, and so we've tried especially to make sure that we kept the things that you liked and did a little bit more of that and didn't throw out anything that people found advantageous. Uh, this is to me one of the, the highlights of learning to think about historical argument. So our big project over the course of the summer is to try to get a better understanding for how historians take primary sources and then turn them into you know, finished works of history. Um, and we started last time by talking about how historians think about sources individually and this particular set of historical thinking skills that historians use when they're sitting down with a new source in order to try to understand it. And this is the great joy and frustration of being a historian is that the sources do not come pre-digested. You have to puzzle it out yourself. And I said a couple of times that um, this is not a, a natural way to think about the world. You kind of have to train yourself and train your students to think historically. But what we're about is trying to demystify this process of how the raw material of primary sources turns into secondary sources. And this is a, the, the first really critical step in that process is being able to examine um, and interpret the sources individually. I have found with my own students um, that they actually get pretty good at this fairly quickly if you give them enough practice. So, you know, by quickly, I mean like four weeks or five weeks in the semester, they start to remember the skills 
but I have to kind of prod them a little bit to not stop there because I think the historical thinking skills are like learning to play, you know, the C major scale, right? It's a, it's a, it's a process you can apply and you can get pretty good at just playing the notes in the scale. Uh, but there's a long way from the C major scale to actually playing music, which is what we want to do. We want to have, you know, a, a historical interpretation, a historical argument at the end. And a lot of my students will kind of get stuck in just playing the notes of the scale and not start putting that together into something that sings like a historical argument. It's the difference between, you know, dribbling around cones in basketball practice. Like this is a really useful skill to have but it's not the same as actually playing a game and using all of the skills together to create something bigger. So today, we're gonna to start talking about historical analysis and historical argumentation as putting sources together and understanding them in conversation with one another, using groups of sources to unlock pieces of the past that are otherwise opaque to us. Best one sentence, definition of history I ever got as a graduate student was, was this, just the study of change over time. How do the various facets of the human experience change and evolve as time goes by? Um, and that's really what historical interpretation is focused on doing, is trying to understand change over time. And we do that by assembling groups of primary sources and then creating analysis that draws them into some kind of coherent story or argument. All of you have done this um, to varying degrees because I know we've got a lot of teaching experience. Today, I wanna to talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that you've started to do you know, subconsciously or intuitively and just naming them a little bit and talking about how historians think about them so that you can become a little more mindful of what you're doing with your students um, and reinforce the lessons that we wanna reinforce. So much of what we do as the producers of history and the consumers of history focuses on cause and effect. You know, what is making that change happen at a particular moment? Um, and so many historical questions boil down in some way to that question of cause and effect. So, you know, we, we've got an outcome, you've got some sort of change over time that led up to that outcome. What is the thing that's moving it in that direction? What is causing the change? Um, and in order to explore groups of sources, Historians use um, a variety of tools. These are, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are, this is a set of three that I've found to be really useful, and I'll build on additional ones with my students if I have more time. But these are, these are kind of three core ways of thinking or sets of questions to ask yourself when you've got a body of sources together and now you're trying to understand them. So you've applied historical thinking to the individual sources, but now you're trying to draw that together to some kind of narrative or some kind of coherent story. Um, again, this is not, not gonna feel like a checklist to you. Um, I think of them as questions to keep my inquiry moving forward. So if you're sitting and you're puzzling over a source or a group of sources, there's gonna be lots of times when you feel like you're at a dead end. These are things that sometimes get me unstuck from a particular dead end. Um, so let's take each of them in turn. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk you through a couple of examples. Uh, using some sources, some new ones and some familiar ones. And then after I've outlined each of those three analytical tools, I'll show you an example of how they might work together in conjunction. And then we'll do the, uh, the think aloud. So I'll put up a set of sources or a source and I will talk using one of these three concepts. And then we'll have a little poll to see which, which one of the concepts you think I'm using. So let's start with uh, perspective, which is just an awareness of how different historical actors you know, occupy a space in relation to events. Um, and there's a raft of questions you might use to kind of get started on this a little bit. Who produced this, this thing that we're looking at? What are their particular interests? How might those interests shade their interpretation of events? And if you're thinking back to our last webinar, you might recognize that, that a lot of perspective draws on two key historical thinking skills. You know, we're thinking about sourcing, we're thinking about context. We're thinking about the position of a particular historical actor or a particular historical institution and trying to think about how the ideas they put in the world reflect their perspective. Every source has a perspective. This is the really critical thing. Um, and I think a lot of our students are still 
come from a place where they they want objectivity. And a word that comes up a lot in my practice and probably a lot in yours as well is this big red word bias. So I have a lot of students will will get a source that I'm distributing in class and I use a lot of sources and they'll get a couple of sentences into it or they'll take a look at the image and they'll say, oh, Professor Henry, this is just, this is really biased. We, we can't use this. It's not objective. And I'm working towards trying to eliminate this language from my practice and talk more about perspective because there's no such thing as a completely objective source. There's no such thing as a source that is completely free of bias. I went to high school back in the 90s and you know we used to think that the textbook was objective. The textbook didn't have a bias or a perspective. And that made a lot of sense when I was a high school student and I believed it for too long. But all you have to do is lay the textbook that my dad had in the 1960s and my uncle had in the 1970s, my textbooks from the 1990s, the textbooks that you guys had, the textbooks your students have had in the 2000s and the 2010s. And you can see there is some change in the way the textbook presents the story. There is a perspective. Um, there's nothing that's objective. And what good historians try to do is to just understand the perspective and take it into account. You could also like, Think about how much really great primary source material we would have to discard if we threw out anything that had, you know, a bias or a point of view. So here's Thomas Jefferson, uh, the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jeff Jefferson's not objective. You know, Thomas Jefferson has a very strong point of view. He thinks that the co colony's independence from the United from the Great Britain is critical and urgent, uh, and he thinks that the king and parliament in London have been acting tyrannically. Like, that's a, that's a real bias, and it affects everything he writes about. We wouldn't want to just crumple up the Declaration of Independence and say, well, it's biased, so we've got to go looking for a, an objective source. I mean, there are great sources that we can still use that are shaded by perspective. Think about that letter that we used in our first session um, that the FBI sent to Dr. Martin Luther King. This just reeks of prejudice and bias in the in the most awful senses. I mean, it's a, it's a horrifying letter um, that says King is less than worthless and and threatens to reveal him as a fraud if he doesn't commit suicide. I mean, this is this is a horrible source. It, it's not objective at all. But as a historian, I I find it interesting for those exact reasons. I don't want to throw this out. Um, what I want to do is try to understand the perspective and understand the point of view and, and then ask myself, why does the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the 1960s, uh, why do they view King this way? Why do they see him as so dangerous? Why do they see his actions as uh, threatening to you know, American society? And why does the FBI think sending a letter like this is okay? So I would use the bias that's just dripping from every sentence here and try to use it to, to trigger some new insights and new ideas. So rather than throw something out for bias, I try to think about what is the perspective here? How is the perspective informed or influenced by the interests of this person or this group? And what is that leading me towards a, uh, in terms of a bigger insight about the historical moment? No one is free of perspective, not even us, right? People will be teaching our classes differently in 20, 25 years. I look back at some of the classes I taught when I first came to Mason, I'm already teaching them differently. And perspective is just taking that into account. Who is this person? What are their interests? How might their interests be visible in the source, be visible in the way that they interact in the world? Let's do a quick one. So uh, here we've got a propaganda poster from the Library of Congress collection. Um, and Clearly an American one. Uh, we've got American GIs on the right and uh, members of the Continental Army on the left. And there's a message that as a, you know, an American, I, I've heard a lot and it makes me feel good. Americans will always fight for liberty. Okay. I guess in high school, I would probably have gotten the source and said, this is just the, the bare truth about the world. Um, there's no perspective here. This is just an objective fact that Americans fight for liberty. But if we went out into the world and looked for other sources that came in roughly the same time, here's a German propaganda poster uh, from the same 14 month period. And it's got a much darker view of America in the world. And here the American forces 
are kind of lampooned as liberators, and it's this kind of horrifying giant monster that's been stitched together from all of the worst parts of America, from the Ku Klux Klan hood uh, to gangsterism, which is the right hand, um, to you know the the Jewish kind of flag draping down you know, the leg of the the robotic creature, which is a, a bomb falling on innocent women and children. Like this is clearly not a source that's free of bias either. There's a there's a strong perspective here. Um, neither of these things is is right. Neither of them is trying to portray the Americans in a perfectly historically accurate sense, but they're both trying, but they both are communicating some valuable insights about what Nazi Germany presented as the truth of the American armies versus what Americans told themselves about their armies. And I wouldn't wanna throw either of these sources out just because we say, oh, they've, they've got some bias there. I'd wanna say, let's use that. Let's embrace the perspective and try to understand more about why the American army is telling one kind of story to its citizens and why the German government is telling a very different story at this moment. And so instead of running away from the perspective, embracing it and trying to use it to get us to deeper insights. Okay, that's perspective. Let's talk about the second one. And this is, I think, the most, um, in some ways, the most complicated and in some ways, the most rewarding way to think about groups of sources together. And this is one that I spend a lot of time puzzling out in my own research. And this one is agency, which we might think of in historical terms as just, you know, the power to make consequential decisions that shape history. Uh, most of you are familiar with this, depending on, on when you went to high school, like this has not always been talked about explicitly, but for a long time, it was just kind of implicit, right? That a very narrow understanding of agency is the thing that runs beneath what used to be called the great man theory of history, or you know, less generously and maybe a little more accurately, like dead white men history, right? Why do we study Churchill? Why do we study George Washington? Why do we study Napoleon Bonaparte? because those are the powerful men, right? Those are the people who have the power to, sh to make consequential decisions. They start wars, they solve wars, they make treaties, they pass laws. Um, you know, they, they have vast amounts of power and everybody else is a citizen or a subject or you know, in some ways has to respond to the decisions that, that these guys make. My textbook didn't talk about agency in that term, but that was definitely the vision of the world that my high school classes we're trying to push out there, right? That, that the power is centralized at the top and that those people are the people that historians should study and that everybody else is kind of subject to the decisions that they make. Um, historians have spent a lot more time in, in say the last 40 or 50 years thinking much more deeply and much more in a much more sophisticated way about agency. Um, so not just centralizing it in the hands of a small number of really obvious people but thinking about where that kind of power comes from, uh, you know, who has it, where it comes from, how it's used, but also its limitations. Um, and then you know, how other historical actors are exercising their own agency. So there, it, it is not simply a world in which Napoleon Bonaparte or Winston Churchill snaps his fingers and says, this is the way that things will be, and then everyone falls into line, right? There is a lot of friction. There is a lot of pushback. Uh, and one of the biggest changes in academic history in the last 50 years has been a better appreciation for how people in groups um, who have not necessarily had agency in the past, um, maybe if we look at it in a different way, we can see ways in which they have some agency. This is a, a, a new term to some people, but the concept is, should be really familiar to you if you stop and think about it for a second. So if you are a teacher, and there are hundreds in my Facebook feed right at the moment, um, who's being you know, compelled by your district to go back to, to a classroom in the fall that you are not convinced is safe and that it's not necessarily a safe situation for you or for your students or for your school staff. And if that's causing you anxiety or problems, you know, what you're feeling there I think is a lack of agency, right? Somebody has made a decision that affects you and you don't feel like you have a lot of power to push back. Um, if you're in a district where people are organizing or protesting, or you're in a school system that's unionized, where you can kind of collectively say, 
we're only willing to do these things or all of us are going to you know, refuse to go. That's exercising agency, right? That's, that's groups coming together and saying, you know, we are, we are going to exert some leverage in, that we have in order to shape the fall semester more to our liking. So you're, you're familiar with the idea of agency, even if the specific term is new to you. Um, so let's take a look at how this might apply to uh, a primary source. This is one that we used um, from the Library of Congress collection last week, um, and it's this runaway slave ad, right? So, so we've got Jefferson, and if you're looking at this, you're saying, all right, someone's run away, Jefferson describes him, and then he says in the last sentence, you know, what he is willing to pay to have this person returned. So if you take a quick look, I mean, you know, who's the agent here? Like, the, well, the most obvious one is Jefferson, right? And, and some of his power is, is pretty obvious, right? He's, he's wealthy, he's white, um, he occupies a kind of elite part of society as a, a legislator and, uh, you know, an uncommonly educated man in the colonies. So he's got a lot of power here. He owns other human beings. He gets some power from that. And a good historian will say, okay, well, where is that power coming from in this case? Like some of it comes from Jefferson's wealth and some of it comes from Jefferson's station in life. But some of it just comes from the fact that Jefferson happens to have been born into 18th century America, into a system that legally and culturally and soci socially believed that it was acceptable for white people to own African Americans. Um, and that there is a whole system, both explicitly uh, legal and, and punitive and then kind of implicitly in just attitudes and behaviors that says this behavior is, is acceptable. Uh, this behavior is something that the society endorses. So it's not just Jefferson because he's wealthy exercising agency, but also kind of the context of the time that he lives in. I think you can go further though if you're really trying to look at this ad and think about who else has got agency. Um, and there's somebody, if you go just below the surface for a second, there's somebody who's a little who's got some power, but you wouldn't suspect it at first. Um, and I might say that that's Sandy, right? Now, as an enslaved person, he's supposed to be kind of the definition of powerlessness, right? He's owned by somebody else, his body, his property, he can't make choices, but he has made one choice, right? He's run away. He has exercised one of the, the few kinds of agency that's available to him to say, I want out of this system. Um, and he's done something that's kind of brave and risky, um, and he's thrown himself in the face of not just Jefferson's anger, but also an entire society that is set up to keep him enslaved. But he has found a way to you know, take his fate into his own hands. And so if you start looking for places in which people who are not generals and not presidents and not kings or dictators are, are taking power and using what power they have, either individually or collectively, to uh, to shape outcomes and to move the world more in a direction they like, that's a really useful way to think about agency. The other thing that we can do is think about all of the limitations that even the wealthy, the powerful, the politically elite have on their own agency. Uh, this is a letter from the Library of Congress collection that we used in our first webinar. Remember, this is Lincoln writing a blind memo to his cabinet uh, in August of 1864, just a few months before the presidential election. Uh, Lincoln is the president of the United States. He is one of the most powerful people. Um, he's certainly one of the most powerful people in North America, and he's one of the most powerful people in the world. He commands, uh, you know, he has a lot of power over the federal government. He has a lot of power over all of the Union armies. I mean, Lincoln has a tremendous amount of agency, and yet all over this letter is evidence of things Lincoln can't do, even given the vast amounts of power he wields. This letter is all about limitations. Lincoln can't make the Confederate army surrender by himself. He can't win the war by himself. He can't force his own reelection. This is a letter that talks a lot about We're not going to be reelected. What are we going to do after that? He can't even compel his cabinet to sign it. Remember, he folds this up and asks them to sign it. And so when you're looking at people who are closer to the bottom of the pyramid, I usually ask myself, how are they exercising agency uh, here in ways that are not immediately obvious? And when I look at people at the top of the pyramid, I think about where does this agency come from and how is it limited? Even somebody who's got a lot of power 
has checks, uh, sometimes legal and sometimes official and sometimes implicit checks. And the more time you, sp you spend thinking about that, the more you get a kind of richer understanding of cause and effect. All right, so that's agency. Uh, and you can spend hours and hours and hours and hours developing a finer understanding of how agency works. Um, it's something that you just practice. The last um, set of you know, interpretive questions that, that's been really helpful to me in my historical research is hindsight. And this is, I think, an idea that we're all really familiar with. Um, just the idea that it, it's easier to understand things after they've happened backwards. Um, so when I put this slide up, my students are all, yeah, hindsight is 2020, right? You can understand the past perfectly if you're looking backwards. And when I was an undergraduate, I thought hindsight is what makes history possible, right? And that's why I can understand the past and make sense of it. Um, it's more complicated than that. And I have come um, you know, in my career now to understand hindsight um, as also a very dangerous thing uh, because it can, it can blind us to what events were like to the participants themselves who do not know how they're going to turn out. Um, and so hindsight and this idea that you know how the story is gonna turn out and therefore it's very easy to go back and look and identify moments that sort of put it on that track. And one of the things I urge my students to do is to practice suspending their hindsight and to think about what can your historical actors see and what can't they see and what could happen differently at different moments. This is, you know, the hindsight is a kind of basis of this popular history, you know, known as turning points. You know, this was the, this was the moment that everything changed. And I think this is an illustration of how dangerous hindsight can be because it, it puts this kind of artificial sense of, well, once you know how the story turns out, you can go back and figure out uh, what happened and what the important decisions were. But that's not at all how it looks to the historical actors. And you can find any number of easy examples, right? So here's one from the Library of Congress collection, uh, a front page of the Times Dispatch uh, about the sinking of the Titanic, right? Now to us, we look back and say, well, of course this thing's gonna sink. Anytime you christen a ship unsinkable, something bad's gonna happen. And it can make you a little smug, that certainly does for my college students. They say, you should have never gotten on that ship. You should have known what was going to happen. Um, that's possible only because we know how things turn out. Uh, and that's not at all obvious to the historical actors or they never would have gotten on on it. And if you are having trouble turning off your hindsight or understanding why that's valuable, I have two great examples. I give my students, because um, most of them, this is lived experience, go back to the Monday before election night in November of 2016, and whatever party you supported, whatever candidate you were hoping would win, did you have a good idea of how that was gonna turn out? Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff, and I spend all my time with people who spend their time thinking about elections, and almost everybody that I know is surprised, up to and including, I think, the president-elect himself, right? There's been, you know, hundreds of books since 2016 trying to understand what happened, and saying, oh, you know, white supremacy or racial anxiety or a historically poor kid, whatever. But the key thing is that as we watch the election results come in, almost everybody was surprised. And if that doesn't kind of free you from hindsight, think about the upcoming election. Do you feel like you have a good sense of how this is all going to turn out? Can you make a, a reliable wager on the outcome? And most of us can't. But in December, we'll all start looking backwards and saying, oh yeah, I can see how that was gonna happen. I can see why that was really important. Turning off your hindsight is really useful in making sense of big, uh, big changes over time in history. Um, here we've got you know, items from the Eli Whitney collection in the Library of Congress. Northerner who invents the cotton gin. And you can certainly find Civil War historians uh, who would say, Slavery was on its way to extinction in the United States until Eli Whitney came along and invented a way to make cotton cultivation pay. And Eli Whitney's uh, invention of the gin is the thing that made slavery take root in the 19th century and put the country on path to civil war. I don't know, man, are we supposed to believe that if Eli Whitney had like slipped in, in the shower and hit himself on the head and died as a teenager, that we wouldn't have had a civil war? That feels like it's putting a tremendous amount of agency on one person's shoulders. And also, it certainly wasn't Eli Whitney's attempt to keep four million African Americans in chains when he had patented the gin. You know, here's someone who's just looking for a way to produce cotton lint more efficiently. So there's an outcome that Whitney cannot, you know, hope to envision. Um, 
And if we want to understand Whitney's time, we need to understand how he understood the world. We could take, you know, other historical figures who loom pretty large and say, well, maybe they are different. So if Eli Whitney has a jet ski accident as a teenager, I think we're, someone's going to invent the cotton gin. Um, and I don't think that the course of American history has changed. But if we took some of the items from the Library of Congress collection on John Brown, and the, and the famous raid that he leads in 1859, which galvanizes both sections of both sections of the white country, north and south, and does seem to kind of put the country on a path to uh, to the outbreak of war just a, a little over a year later. So, what makes this kind of uh, historical event a little bit different than somebody inventing? the light bulb or the cotton gin. What is it about John Brown's moment, what kind of agency to reach back to the previous term, is he exercising? John Brown is really interesting too because uh, unlike the vast majority of historical actors, Brown seems to understand what's happening. And this is a reproduction of his, the, his last message which he hands to, hands to his executioner as he ascends the gallows. Um, and it's stunningly prescient, right? The crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood, I had vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. People in 1859 thought these were the rantings of a lunatic. And yet John Brown's vision forward was uncannily accurate. And so we might go back and say, what, what did John Brown see that his contemporaries could not? And that might open up further insights for us as to why this kind of change happened at this particular time. But the most useful way in my experience to make sense of hindsight is to practice turning it on and off. Okay, so that's perspective, agency, and hindsight. It's a way to think about events and sources as a group. Um, and let me just reassure you once, a lot of this is gonna feel alien. Um, the historical thinking skills are unnatural, right? It's not a normal way to think about the world uh, and you have to practice it. I would say that thinking about perspective and agency and hindsight actually is a very natural way to think about the world. You do this, um, Obviously, all of you do this when you're teaching, even if you don't think about these terms. But I think most people do this. Anytime you hear anybody arguing about politics or sports, they're thinking about these things, although they're probably not naming them. They don't understand these terms the way that they're using them. But that's part of the way that we talk about the human experience. So we could go back, you know, current events. You know, here's Colin Kaepernick, and people will argue sports and politics about what it means to take a knee. But a historian would say, well, you know, what, what, what's the message? When, where does his agency come from? What's Colin Kaepernick's perspective? Um, and how is a football player suddenly using the agency that he has? He's not a legislator, he's not an elected official. What kind of agency does he have? How is he using it? How is it creating ripples of change? Um, we could go to, you know, the top of the, the pyramid, um, somebody who has as much power in the United States as just about anybody, the president, and here's, uh, you know, one of a series of tweets about this. Look at, you know, the kind of agency that the president doesn't have here. He can't force Kaepernick to stand up. He can't force the commissioner of the NFL to do things. Um, and then we get change over time. You know, all of a sudden, um, the kinds of agency that Kaepernick is uh, expressing do start moving things in ways that are kind of surprising if you think about him as a professional athlete first. Um, and change over time is happening all the time. We see it all, you know, all over the place. Here in Washington, D.C., the NFL franchise has had a, um, a mascot with a really ugly racial slur um, that for years the owner had said he would never change under any circumstances. And nobody had the official agency to force him to change it. And in the last week or two, they've announced that they're finally going to get rid of it. And so a historian starts thinking, why now? Why this kind of change, specifically at this moment? And who are the different players and what are their perspectives and how are they exercising different kinds of agency and leverage to get other sometimes more powerful people to do what they want. So you're, you do this all the time in your day-to-day -day lives. Learning about it as a historian is just kind of mindfully being aware of what you're doing as you do it. Thinking about cause and effect in a kind of regimented way. All right, so let's play a little music, right? We talked about running the notes in the C scale. Let's talk about how this all works. So let me try to use all three things um, with a set of sources. So this is a great, very famous photograph uh, that's part of the LOC collection. And here we've got Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme uh, Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force on the eve of the D-Day invasion. 
uh, talking to members of the 101st Airborne. And there's some interesting stuff going on, right? So we've got agency, like Eisenhower's got a lot because he's got those four stars on his shoulder. And the soldiers have got agency too. Like Eisenhower's not actually going to be in the battle and he's not going to be pulling any triggers. So the soldiers have some agency, although it's a different kind. And we've got some different kinds of perspective available here. Um, Eisenhower is a kind of older soldier who's never been under fire himself. Eisenhower was not in combat in the First World War. And he's here you know, telling these guys that they have to go make this attack that's going to cost a lot of them their lives the next day. And they are, you know, in many cases, combat veterans. We've got a, a, a real difference in perspective. Uh, and we've got other documents that come into play um, in this kind of historical moment, too. So there's the uh, order of the day that goes out to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. If you've got a grandparent or great-grandparent who was part of this and they kept one thing, it's probably this. Um, we talked last week about, or last session, about close reading. Here is Eisenhower making some of the emendations and changes. So you can see in real time the choices that he's making. But if we blow this up, a lot of this is about agency, about what's happening, what's about to happen, why the United States soldiers should be confident in their victory, and where is their agency coming from? You're fighting with brothers in arms on multiple fronts. The home front has supplied you with the, the finest material of warfare. Uh, you should be confident in your own ability to shape the outcome of the war, but not too confident because the Nazis are gonna fight hard too. You have a powerful opponent and this thing will have to be decided by force on force. So we've got agency, we've got some different perspectives where Eisenhower is, is speaking to them as part of you know, a, a morale talk. But we've got other documents too as we pull in more and more sources. This is a very private note that Eisenhower writes on the eve of the invasion that he's going to release in case they fail. And there's tons of fascinating stuff going on here. So first of all, the way in which in those emendations and the cross outs, Eisenhower talks about taking the full responsibility, which is Eisenhower shifting the agency and the burden onto himself. But also there's a little light going on in my, in my historian's brain about hindsight, right? If we just start here, you think, oh yeah, Omaha Beach, turning point in the war. This is, these brave men are gonna go liberate Europe from Nazi tyranny. But Eisenhower's perspective in the moment, victory on D-Day is anything but a foregone conclusion. In fact, he's already preparing what he's going to say to the press in case it fails. So there's a moment of hindsight, a turning point, things could have been different. So you pull all the sources together and then you just start asking yourself a set of questions. And I don't do it in any specific order. It just takes some time. Um, sometimes a lot of time. You have to sit with these things and you have to ask yourself a series of sometimes frustrating questions about what it is they're trying to tell you about a particular historical moment or a particular kind of historical change over time. There is so much more going on in this picture than just general addresses a bunch of troops before battle. All right, let's, uh, let's let you kind of see how well you can identify these skills. So much like we did last time, we're gonna do a quick poll. So I'm gonna put up a, a source or a group of sources and I'm gonna kind of talk through what I'm thinking in my head if I encounter those sources. And then at the end, you're gonna weigh in and say whether what you, th you think you're seeing is, is best characterized as perspective or as agency or as hindsight. And I'll warn you like, you know, there's right-ish answers, but there's some overlap in these historical thinking skills. So there's, there's no wrong answer. You'll probably hear me practice each of these things at least briefly. Um, those are the rules of the game. Good to go? Let's play. Let's play. All right, so I'm thinking aloud. Um, okay, there is a lot of power in this picture and it's moving from right to left. So uh, I see a bunch of armed and uniformed they, they are police or state troopers, so they carry not just firearms, but they've also got um, kind of the power of the state behind them. And then on the left, I'm nervous because the, that group seems to have a lot less power, both in terms of they're not armed um, and they are African-American in a moment that I'm kind of inferring that the entire legal system is stacked against them. So. This is a confrontation um, that feels to me like it is going to be very lopsided and makes me concerned. Um, oh, we've got more images. Okay, so 
this is a little bit different because now I see there's actually a lot of people involved here. And so while they're peaceful and they're not armed, um, boy, there's a guy on the front who's on crutches, uh, but there's a lot of them. Um, and that seems to be kind of powerful in its own way. Oh, yeah, I've seen this image before. So this is what happens when the peaceful protesters meet the violent power of the state. And it's that's a really ugly image to look at. Although it's making me think for a second that there's something I didn't consider in the first, in any of these photos actually, so there's somebody else here as well, uh, the person taking the photographs so the press and the power that these images have when they are on the front page of newspapers across the country and the power that these, um, the footage has when it's on the nightly news kind of makes me think a little differently about the way I had weighed that balance at the get-go. So maybe I need to go back and learn a little bit more about this sequence of events and kind of revisit the direction that power is flowing. Okay, that's my think aloud. Take a second to, to think about it. And Lynn, you will stand by and collect the results. Yep, all right, we've just launched. We want everyone to take a guess, right or wrong. Go for it. Let's see, we've got, we're voting quickly today. We're up to almost 60%, keep it awesome. coming. See, 85, get the last votes in. It's... Give it five more seconds, take your guess. It's like Jeopardy, but we don't sing. We, we have not licensed the theme. All right. So we've got 113 of you voting. And let's see how we turned out. Yeah. So I think there's elements of both of both perspective and hindsight are there because you really don't do these things separately. But the primary one I was driving at was agency and kind of power flows and power dynamics there. Um, let's play one more game. Um, different source, let me just do the think aloud and then we will um, see what you think you, you heard. Uh, okay, um, government, I'm guessing World War II, this has got an OWI brand on it. Okay, so there's a couple of points of view visible here. So two panels, the top we got like Mrs. Moneybags and she looks fairly rich and she's awfully happy. And I guess I understand why, because she's walked away with, she's bought out the store. It's like empty shelves and hooks. We've got a storekeeper and his point of view is kind of consternation. And, and then this sort of less well-off younger housewife and her point of view seems to be like frustration bordering on outrage and like Mrs. Moneybags has walked off with everything. In the bottom, the points of view are different because we've got this rationing means a fair share for all of us. So if we don't ration, Mrs. Moneybags gets everything. If we do ration, everyone gets a fair share and everyone's happier. Not just the housewife, who I can obviously is happier because she's getting some stuff and it looks like the shopkeeper is much happier and it looks like he's got more money. But also Mrs. Moneybags looks happier. And that's curious, right? Why is she happy? Because she's got less. And that makes me think maybe there's another, a fourth point of view here, which is the point of view of the US government. And what they need people to think or believe about rationing, because I'm, I'm not at all clear why Mrs. Moneybag's point of view would be that rationing works better. And I think maybe there's a real subtle point of view that's coming across here, which is, the people that made this poster that are putting it out to advertise an idea. So I maybe need to go back and think a little bit more about the sourcing. Okay, that's my think aloud. Why don't you guys take a quick second and see what you thought was on display there. Oh, we're doing good, about 80%. Keep them coming, take your guess. I need to make these tests harder. <laughs> All right, we're at 90. Last couple answers. Go ahead and get them in. We're going to keep it open for another five seconds. Again, it's most important that you guess. If you're wrong, you're wrong. That's okay. We want you to guess. That actually helps us. All right, let's call it there. See how we did. Yeah, and again, like you could hear elements of agency and hindsight in there. 
But I think the key thing was thinking about perspective and points of view and how this one, you know, introducing rationing might look really different to different groups. What we're asking you to do in the next assignment is to practice one of these interpretive tools with at least two sources. So, you know, things that are surrounding temperance and try to understand how groups are, sources are reflecting different kinds of perspective or how different groups are interacting and kind of flexing their agency or their leverage or a moment where something is not obvious to historical actors. I'm gonna turn things over to Lynn and then um, I will stick around and we will do Q&A afterwards. Uh, so if you've got questions, I will have answers. All right, well, thank you, Christopher. We're gonna do a little bit of a transition here to think about some of the ways that our students find these primary sources because they've got to be able to access them in order to practice these skills that we've been talking about. And one of the things that we did on intentionally as part of this module is I literally reached behind me, the shelf behind me has my US history textbooks, and I grabbed one of them and we scanned out the selection of pages that have to do with temperance. We did that for two reasons. One is that we wanted to give you a good, simple, short, secondary overview of where it would show up in different student texts. But we also wanted to do this activity where we go from a secondary source and find the primary source contained within. We always tell students, look, you've got to go to the source, but sometimes it's kind of hard to go to the source. So what I'm sharing here is a page from the book, and I want you to notice three things. So we're on page 350 of the textbook, and I'm interested in this image here. I, I'm kind of drawn to it because of the woman in the red dress. Red's my favorite color. But I'm looking at this and thinking, wow, something about temperance is being communicated here. This is kind of a, an interesting image. And I know from the caption that it was created by Kellogg and Comstock around 1850, but I don't know too much more. And a lot of students would take this and go, oh, I've got a primary source. No, you've got a secondary source, you've got a book. But one of the things that I think we don't always do a, as good a job with is teaching them how to go from secondary to primary. So I'm looking at this image and I'm going, okay, there's gotta be a credit line. So when I look in the book, there is an image section. Remember, it's page 350. And it tells me that the image on page 350 was a gift of Mrs. Samuel St. John Morgan at the Connecticut Historical Society. Well, if I live in Hartford, Connecticut, that's great. If I'm in Texas, that's not really gonna help me. So I'm starting to think through this and I go, okay, maybe there's one of these and it's at the Connecticut Historical Society, but maybe there's more of them. Who else might house them? And a lot of times students just stop there, but we actually wanna teach them the skills to go the next step. This is a trick. If you have not learned this, this is one of those tricks, the second you learn this, you kind of feel silly that you didn't learn it before. One thing we can do with our cameras and our scanners is do a reverse image search. So what you do is you go to images.google.com and rather than typing in what you think you're looking for, you hit the little camera button. When you hit the camera button, you have two choices. You can either paste the URL of the image or click the second tab and upload the image. So I took a picture of the image with my phone and I uploaded it to see what I could find. And I actually found two things. One is I found, oh, there's other images that are kind of like this. But the first hit is telling me, hey, this temperance banner is part of the collection of the Smithsonian, the National Museum of American History. And I just took a screenshot here, but you can scroll down and there's a lot of different information here. Well, this is interesting. So that's kind of one option. Next thing we might want to consider is smart searching on Google. Because I know from taking this class that the Library of Congress has a tremendous amount of number of resources on this topic. But I want to search, but I only want to search loc.gov. And the way you do that is you put the word of the phrase that you want to search, and then you say site colon loc.gov. You're telling Google, I only want you to search this site. That's another way to look at it. And when I do that, I actually find a whole set of temperance banner images for me to look at at loc.gov. That's another pathway. Third path, or fourth pathway, excuse me, is to do a refined search directly on loc.gov. And going there, remember, everything in LOC is in its collections. So the photograph collection, manuscripts, et cetera. So I can go there, I can t go there, okay, which division do I wanna search? And I'm gonna search the keyword temperance banner. 
Remember, the Library of Congress organizes everything by the title the image or artifact had. So we have to use some different words, but I'm just going to stick with the broad one. I'm going to use temperance banner. And I was actually surprised because I found an image. The first hit that came up was a really interesting image. And I'm looking at this going, hmm, this is sort of kind of like what we saw in the textbook, but it's not exactly. And if you look quickly, it almost looks like the same. When I put them side by side, so I've got the image from the textbook on the left and the image from the Library of Congress on the right, I notice a couple different things. I notice that there's a gentleman in the middle and he's being drawn two ways. To the left, there's a woman in white with some different accessories. To the right, there's another woman and she's dressed in something a little bolder for the time period and she seems to be kind of taking him in a certain direction. Now, if I was looking at this as two pieces of student work, I'd start to think that they're kind of, man, they're working together. Somehow this idea of temperance is being communicated around the same time, so circa 1850, 1851, by two different organizations, so by Courier on one side and Kellogg and Comstock on the other, but they're pretty much putting out the same image. Hmm, this is something that in terms of communication and history, I'm interested in and I might want to do a little more digging. I also want to keep reminding you that when you're searching the Library of Congress on once you get any kind of search result you have the ability to click a banner on the left and limit your search and this is really really helpful. I suggest sometimes it's best to start big and then limit down to whether it's the time period, the location, the section of the library that you're trying to look in because I find that those strategies are helpful. Keep in mind I know that as a teacher, you probably know some or many or even all of these strategies, but we have to keep in mind that just because our students know how to use a computer doesn't mean they know how to search effectively. And you have to stop your class. I think too, we're going to be facing some challenges with students working with digital and online resources. The excellent part of that is that there's tremendous number of resources that are out there, but we've got to teach them how to search efficiently effectively and to use those smart searching strategies. All right, we are just about at our hour here. So we're gonna do like we did last time. We are going to go ahead and open up to questions. So we are open up to any kind of questions that you have. Ashley's been uh, in charge of that question box and she's gonna share some of them out. But it's really important if you need to go, we do understand, but you've got to take a minute, tinyurl.com slash NHDHA21. I want everybody who's watching to please give us that feedback. I take it, I share it, and we use it to make modifications, adjustments, things like, hey, can you share a bibliography? Yes, if you give us feedback, we use that feedback. We don't just dump it in a report. So, Ashley, I know there's been some good questions in here. Uh, let's hear it. What do we have got? All right, I have two for you first. All right. Uh, first question. Uh, Carol would like to know that thesis doesn't need to be a paragraph long, five sentences. What are kind of the rules on that? All right. Thesis statements, short and sweet is the key. Honestly, I know in the English language arts world, the rule is one sentence. Realistically, in history, it's usually two sentences. I'm going to say three sentences max. If you're getting into sentences four, five, and six, chances are you're going beyond the argument. You're getting into historical context, you're setting some background, you're trying to give more detail. Hammer it in. Another way to think about it is think about 50 words, 50 to 60 words, somewhere in that range. Now, keep in mind, if you haven't watched it yet, in the module two, what to read and watch folder, we've got a really quick little video. When I go out and do training and we practice thesis statements, that's what I do. So the key is to make sure the four elements are in your thesis statement, right? Make sure you have a topic, make sure you set your parameters, make sure you make a clear or explicit link to the theme. Remember, we're talking communication and history, right? So I should hear something about communicating, miscommunicating, lack of communication, um, Watched communication, something about it. it. doesn't care the tactic you take, but the fourth part is the key. It's got to be an argument and not just a statement of fact. If you just tell us what happened in the temperance movement, that's not an argument. So the test for you, kind of you, like, you know, multiply and then you divide to check to make sure your answer's right. The check on this is to see if somebody can argue against it. 
Can someone take a different perspective or a different tact? If you've got those four elements, you've got a solid thesis statement. But if you got five, six, seven sentences, my suggestion, edit down, look at suggestions. The reason why we do that activity on the discussion board is not only are you seeing yours and edits and suggestions, you're seeing other people's. So learn not just from your suggestion to the board, but learn from what others are putting up and the feedback that they're getting. All righty, next question uh, from Melinda. Do both of our sources for our assignment this week need to support our thesis statement or is it okay if they're just about the topic of temperance? Well, I, I would say if we're really kind of going down this path, which, you know, we're going down this path to building an argument, I would choose two that are gonna help you build that argument. Um, at the end of the day, I, you know, arguments evolve and change. So we're not necessarily matching it up and giving two points for making the match, but we wanna build you to that idea of making an argument. So choosing two that help support that is only gonna help you in the long run. Okay. All right, a couple more questions and then Christopher, a couple of questions on agency. All right. Um, Avon asked, could you explain the paragraph better? Would, uh, is it what we would expect students to write as a historical paper or is it a reflection of our research? I would say this is a reflection of your research. We're looking at you to say, okay, you, you've done one source in depth. Now we want you to step back and look at two side by side. And again, it's a paragraph. Please don't make it more of an assignment or more of a task than it is. Um, I think sometimes when we get into something like this, we overthink it and we want to turn it into a doctoral dissertation. And really, we're looking at a paragraph here. And please don't make it harder on yourself than it is. All right, Christopher. From Melissa, do you think it's acceptable to teach this as perspective while clarifying that within perspective lies bias? Or is it your position that we completely ignore the notion of bias because it's a loaded word today? I think a lot of that has to do with um, the level of your class and the kind of makeup of your class. Um, I think where bias gets, so I, I certainly believe in the concept of bias. I think where it gets dangerous is when um, something is being presented as an as a objective source, but it's actually deeply biased. So you, you would never, uh, you know, put, you know, Ku Klux Klan material from the 1950s in your classroom and say, well, this is just describing the objective reality of, you know, race relations in the, in the South. Um, at the same time, I don't think, I don't think you have to throw everything out. Um, certainly as you get into high school and then into college, um, you know, like, all right, it is biased. Let's understand what the bias is and let's see if we can't try to kind of trace back um, how the bias came to be and what it represents and what it might be telling us about the historical moment. So the Klan, so like in that, you know, that Klan pamphlet, like it says all sorts of horrible things about African Americans and, you know, the, you know, all the things that they can't do and they can't participate in and they shouldn't have these rights. But it doesn't say we should round all the African Americans up and murder them or deport them or force them to go north. And then you might say, well, that's interesting. If they hate them so much and they're so terrible, why don't they want them gone? And you think, oh, because they need them. Because even white, you know, deeply biased Klansmen need African Americans as workers and as customers and as, you know, also like the what Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South can't function without African American people. And so you can kind of take the bias and use it to unlock some other insight. This is, you guys are the best judge of where your student or your group of students is at a particular moment. And certainly I think you can, you can introduce these ideas um, and be more, um, you know, kind of sophisticated with them as you get, as you get students who are a little older. I, I would never want to say like, oh, we have to, everything is exactly the same. And I, and I, you know, like a lot of you are seeing all sorts of conspiracy theories on your social media or whatever, like, I think the antidote to that is historical thinking, right? Is learning to think about who made this, what did it come, where did it come from, what pers perspective does it represent, and, and to what degree do I find this trustworthy? So, you know, why, where does Anthony Fauci get his agency? You know, partly it's his record, and partly it's his office, and partly it's his training. And then what does that guy, uh, you know, 
Dakota, who, who got a D in my high school biology class, like where does his agency come from when he says he's done research and he doesn't believe in a, a certain thing? Like, well, historical thinking helps you understand that, helps you understand perspective and the relative weights you ought to account, you know, you ought to um, attribute to different kinds of sources. So middle school, I'd be real careful. High school and college, I think you can start kind of dialing up the sophistication and say, well, it has a perspective, but we don't have to get rid of it just because of that. All right, I'm gonna merge a couple of questions together that people are asking about. Um, so from Wes and Harry, um, confirming, is agency asking the question of what uh, power does someone have and where it comes from? And are agency and leverage pretty much interchangeable? So, so power is the great question, by the way. So, so power is the number one synonym that, that people will use. Um, power kind of connotes some things about violence or um, you know, strength that agency is a little broader of a term. So, because um, you see people exercising agency in ways that are not always obvious and not always um, you know, physical shows of strength. Um, I think leverage captures part of it um, and certainly that in those John Lewis photographs, like a, a tremendous amount of the agency comes not just from the, you know, so, so John Lewis has, you know, as much personal courage as any American of the 20th century, like his willingness to lead a group of people across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, knowing exactly what is likely to meet them on the other side and willing to get his skull fractured. That is as much physical courage as you're going to find in the 20th century. Um, there are African Americans who have that amount of physical courage in the 1880s and the 1840s and the 1910s, right? Like, so as a historian, you're thinking, what's, what's the change? Why is this moment so, you know, why does this moment move things forward in the way that, you know, Nat Turner wasn't able to do in, in, in his rebellion? And I think part of that comes from leverage and part of the leverage comes from context. So there are people in the press there taking pictures and, taking footage and putting it on uh, television. There's also the context of this global Cold War. So the United States and the Soviet Union are engaged in this huge titanic struggle about which system works better. And the fact that the Americans are out in the United Nations and in global news saying the American system is better, it offers liberty and equality and freedom and a high quality of life to all. And that's a really important message as the globe is being divided up between the two powers. Well, People like Martin Luther King and John Lewis and leaders in the civil rights movement understood that that offered them leverage, that by putting out images that undercut the message that the United States needed to be put, needed to put into the world, gave them a moment. And that the, these new technologies um, of television and a television set in every living room gave that a, a platform, amplified their message in ways that that hadn't occurred before. We're seeing something, I think, kind of similar with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. I mean, you know, Emmett Till is viciously beaten and murdered, um, and that's publicized, and it's well worth looking into the images of exactly what that looked like. Um, you know, why didn't that trigger the kind of avalanche that we've seen in the last two months? Well, I think one thing is, you know, this. Everybody is carrying a powerful video camera that's also connected to the interwebs so that you can, you know, everybody is now a journalist and everybody can share their stuff um, instantly. So in, you know, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it's the AP and the wire services that determine what people get to see. And that's not the case anymore either. And so those are kind of, you know, so there's more leverage and now people can use technology to say, we're going to have this demonstration. We're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to show the way that the state is using its power and we're going to use that as leverage and that's turned out to be overwhelmingly overwhelmingly powerful internationally so i'm a historian i think a lot about hindsight i could have never envisioned this in march when they were canceling the ncaa tournament that all of a sudden we were going to have this massive tectonic shift in american race relations and American social policy. Now, you know, in the fall, I'll go back and I'll say, well, here's how you could see that coming. And here's some of the reasons that it was likely to happen the way that it happened. But that's my hindsight. In the moment, not at all clear how things were going to go. All right. A couple more questions. Let's see what we got here. All right. Kristen says, you mentioned agency, perspective, and hindsight are three of a larger list of ways of thinking you go over with your students. What would some of the others be? Sure. So, so they're all kind of interrelated. So I picked some of the, um, 
the top ones. Um, I, the next one um, would be something called contingency, which has a lot to do with hindsight and a little to do with agency. And it's sort of like these branch moments where what would have happened if, you know, this person had won the election or if this regiment had showed up earlier to the battle or if this person, uh, you know, had not been freed on a technicality or, um, and so that's a really useful way to think about these bigger changes in the past. Um, you know, what are, what are the kind of contingent moments where, boy, everything could have turned out differently if something small had happened. And again, we, we, think, of, we think in these ways very naturally when we're talking sports or politics or kind of day-to-day -day life. Um, but think about, you know, Eli Whitney, or, or let's think about Thomas Edison, right? So who, who thinks, you know, who is responsible for more inventions that change the 20th century than Edison? Um, what would have happened if Edison had slipped and fallen in the, in the shower and, you know, cracked his skull open and died at age 14? Like, would we be sitting here having our little internet webinar in a room lit by oil lamps? Like, you know, if, if Edison had, had not lived to adulthood and invented these things, would we be without those things? Or how would the world look a little different? You know, how it, were those inventions likely to happen anyway? They just would have come into the world in a different moment. These things, you know, require some kind of long-term thinking and, and they're not as helpful, I think, for, for middle and high school students and even for undergraduates because it quickly turns into that kind of counterfactual world of, well, if so-and-so had, you know, shown up to the Battle of First Manassas, then the South would have won the war and then the slavery would have never ended and the 20th century would have been different. And it very quickly kind of piles, you know, counterfactual what-if questions on other what-if questions in a way that I don't think is really useful for, for most kind of new learning historians. Uh, but picking out a moment of contingency and saying, what would have needed to happen for this moment to be different? Uh, and why did we get the moment that it had? And, and often the, the place to start with this is just the ways in which the historical actors themselves are thinking about contingency. This is a lived moment for them and many of them see themselves as, you know, kind of standing at a moment of change. We saw that, you know, three times just in the last hour, right? So there's Eisenhower saying, this invasion tomorrow will hopefully succeed. It may fail and either way it is going to be a big deal. We saw Lincoln, you know, six, eight weeks before the election saying, we are probably going to be defeated and what are we going to do then? Uh, and we saw John Brown saying, you know, he had just passed a moment of contingency, right? His failed attempt to incite an insurrection had in his last words there left them in a moment where, um, you know, the, the sins of this guilty lamb can no longer be purged except by blood. And you see this all the time. So go back and read MLK in, in the I Have a Dream speech. I mean, he talks about this is a moment. And if things do not change now in a peaceful way that embraces justice, it is going to be ugly. I mean, that, that speech is kind of, it's, it's not laced with threats so much. It's just warnings that sweltering in the heat of injustice, the choices are not give African Americans equality and civil rights or expect them to remain quiet and placid. Like that, that, those are not the choices and King is kind of laying out a contingency there. That, that, that draws on hindsight, it draws on agency a lot, you know, kind of who has the power to shift things at this moment. Um, and a little bit on perspective and how do different, different historical actors see the world and how do they define what they want to achieve. All right, from Lexi. In terms of bias perspective, uh, in terms of I have a bias perspective question. I have students who will often try and find bias in everything. And they'll find it. <laughs> and even everything has bias. <laughs> and they'll do it to the point of overanalyzing even tertiary sources. And there will, their conclusions will sometimes border on those conspiracy theories. Any advice for teaching this type of student? Well, first of all, I'll see them in graduate school in 10 years, because the people who are overanalyzing the tertiary sources, that's where they're headed. So scare them straight if you can. Um, I think there's a kind of sweet spot, right? So there's an awareness of there's an awareness uh, that everything has a perspective. I have a perspective. Like I said, I go back and I look at the way I taught the Civil War 10 years ago, and it's just different than the way I taught it last fall. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to be real different when I teach it again next uh, in the fall of 2021. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a completely objective source who is just sitting and saying, this is, this is the, the truth without any, uh, you know, any taint of, of any outside influence. Um, 
but there's also something, but so there's a sweet spot there, kind of appreciating that the perspective exists, but you can way go too far. And I think this, the kind of American belief in conspiracy theories is a real American belief and one that goes back 80 or 100 years. Uh, we, we, we are an audience for that kind of thinking in ways that other countries generally aren't. Um, I sometimes talk to my students about um, Occam's Razor. Um, so the Occam's Razor is a, a kind of thought exercise that suggests that if you've got, you know, several different explanations for the same phenomenon, that the simplest one is likely the truth. And it goes back to William of Ockham, who's a philosopher and thinker from centuries and centuries ago. But if you've got a student who says, well, I looked at this thing and I looked at the CDC pamphlet, which says you should wear a mask uh, and that masks will reduce the transmission of uh, you know, COVID-19. But then I found this thing on YouTube, which says that the masks are, uh, you know, that, that Fauci is making profits from masks and that Bill Gates has you know, released COVID so that he could uh, license the vaccine. And this is, you know, that... You know, Trump is, is part of this, you know, he's working with Fauci and with Bill Gates in a way like, I, maybe, you know, maybe there's this, you know, really deep thousand person conspiracy that's trying to do this, or maybe it's just a very virulent respiratory disease that's easily transmitted through air particles and that the mask is a cheap and simple way to cut down on that and that the CDC and the people who are putting out their ideas actually have the public health of the country in mind. My advisor used to say that it was important to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain fell out, right? You, you want to be open enough to understand that there's usually a little more complexity lurking under the surface than most of us appreciate at first glance, but not so open-minded that any ridiculous explanation that somebody offers that you just say, oh, that must be it. Um, and, you know, in, in his, historically, the number of conspiracy theories is, you know, vanishingly small. It's just very hard to keep things a secret. Um, because, you know, whenever people gather together to try to plan something, even when they're trying to keep it a secret, you have to communicate things in writing. Writing makes sources, sources make records, and now the historians are going to call it open season on you. So even things that people badly wanted to keep secret produce trails of evidence. Uh, and I think, you know, not to proselytize too much, but, you know, I think historical thinking, not just great for history teachers and historians and for us, but like, this is the thing that's going to save us, right? Being, having a healthy skepticism about the world, and then a set of skills and a way to think about the world to make it make sense that is not based on this kind of magical thinking of, it's Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci and, you know, John Lennon, who's, whose death was faked in 1980, and they're all working together to, you know, the simplest explanation is is usually the right one. And so I'll kind of try to rein some of those students who are over eager and say, occasionally I'll pull one out. You know, so they always want to say, I've, I've heard that, that FDR allowed uh, the Pearl Harbor attack to happen because he wanted something that would jar America into joining World War II. And rather than say, that's a ridiculous conspiracy theory, take that nonsense away from my classroom, I'll pause and say, okay, what, what, what kinds of sources would that produce? What kinds of evidence? Who would need to be part of that? What kinds of documentation would, would have been produced? How easily would it have been to destroy all of that documentation? How big would a group that was working together on this, you know, and I'll make them list all the people who would have needed to be uh, involved and how long they would have to stay quiet and say, do we, you know, wh which makes more sense that, that 12,000 people, including all these kind of naval officers and, and naval seamen and people on, people in the the press, like all conspired to keep this thing a secret so that F and FDR let the United States be attacked uh, so that he could get the United States to join the war, or that the Japanese planned a very effective sneak attack that worked. When the United States does something sneaky and effective, um, you know, when we, when we send special forces in to assassinate bin Laden, we assume like, well, that, you know why that worked? Because we're really good at what we do. Um, and sometimes the, you know, our opponents and our enemies, political, you know, cons commercial, military, they're good at what they do too. We have time for a couple more. I'm here We're all good. day. It is all 149 right. degrees in Washington, D.C. So I'm happy <laughs> to sit here and talk history with y'all. All right. 
a couple of questions of people at tossing out ideas and hoping you'll give them feedback on whether or not they are suitable forms of agency. Okay. So first one, would a good example of other actors agency be the fact that Churchill lost the 1945 prime minister election despite all that he had accomplished? Oh, sure. That's a great one. I don't even think that one's really controversial. So that's clear agency, right? The agency at the ballot box. Um, you know, it's a limitation of Churchill's agency. So, you know, Churchill gets gets thrown out before that war's over, right? Um, so despite all that he's accomplished, um, he does not have the power to, to put his thumb on the, uh, on the electoral box. And there's no one, uh, there's no one Britain who can unseat Churchill, right? Nobody has that power, but by voting for members of parliament and the way that the members of parliament cast their votes, like those guys, acting in the aggregate have a lot of agency, right? And, and you see that all the time. So any political election, absolutely agency, right? Uh, we'll get an interesting one um, in the fall because uh, I, I saw President Trump interviewed over the weekend and they, the interviewer asked if he would abide by the terms of the election if he lost. And he was, you know, said, we'll have to see. So that would be an interesting way for, for an outgoing president to try to seize agency by breaking norms saying like, well, I'm just not going to go. I'm not going to declare that the election results legitimate. And then we'll have, boy, you want to talk about agency in 50 different forms coming to a crash, you know, right at 1600 Pennsylvania. That'll be really interesting. Um, you know, who's got power? How is it limited? Who is working in coordination with, with other groups and who is working, you know, at odds with other groups? But yeah, any political campaign, any political election, Absolutely agency. If you want to scratch further and use agency as a tool, it's like, why does Churchill lose? What do we know about the motivations for the people who are casting votes in support and casting votes against? And, and what, what does Churchill say about it? Um, that, so that would be a way to use agency as not just a, you know, an ending point and saying I figured something out, but as a jumping off point for another set of questions. All right, from Christy, uh, in reference to the runaway ad that you showed, mm -hmm. uh, might we also say the newspaper has agency yeah. the power to influence society by running the ads? That's great. Um, I didn't even think about that. That's a that's really smart. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like the the fact that um, you know Jefferson and Sandy exist in this world where there is a a magazine and there's print and the print has circulation, you know, kind of changes the terms of their agency. If Sandy had run away. 200 years previous, before the widespread dissemination of newspapers, Jefferson would have had a lot less agency because he would have had less ability to kind of put out this message. Um, and, you know, so, and then the way things will change too. So who can read in 1767? You know, that's a very powerful tool of agency, just being literate. Uh, who is able to, to look at these, you know, symbols on a page and translate them into thoughts and ideas? And then you might say, Hey, why is it illegal in the in the South um, to teach African Americans to read? What is it about that kind of agency that the white South sees as so critical that it be denied to enslaved people? And so that's another kind of like you, you use it not as a stopping point. Like I think there's another agent here just in the people who are disseminating the magazine, but using it as a jumping off point to say. What are some new questions or insights that I can develop from that? All right, one for Lynn from Kathleen. Can you speak to where we're going next after this thesis statement and paragraph, i.e. what's the final project or our goal? Absolutely, well, and again, we've got it kind of outlined on the syllabus. Module one is about getting into one source. Module two is stepping back and trying to commit, looking at a group of sources and trying to pick and choose. Module three and four is all going to be about building an argument. Now, when I say building an argument, that's not building a history day project. It's building an outline. We're going to work with a graphic organizer, which depending on how you type will be anywhere from two pages, three pages max. It's really compact, but you're essentially building the spine or the backbone taking your thesis statement that you got feedback for and you'll get feedback for from 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 your facilitator making any revisions and saying okay if this is my argument how am i going to support it what's my argument what's my reasoning what's my evidence it sounds challenging and intellectually it can be challenging because we've got to make the case and then we've got to back it up 
and we're working with a set of sources. We're not asking you to go out and do a whole bunch of research. We want to work with what we have and say, hey, how do you structure an argument? And once you have that structure, yes, you, we're not asking you to turn it into a documentary or into an exhibit board or into a paper, but that's really the core. And we're going to help you develop and revise and refine an argument that my hope is then you can take that skill with what you've learned about searching the sources of the Library of Congress to really help your students. Because honestly, in my opinion, a good argument, a good, solid, well-defended argument is really what separates History Day projects. That separates from like the good and nice and it's done to a, wow, look at that and look at what that student did. And really by helping to do that structure, this is something I think you're going to take and I hope you're going to take back and work with your students with this year in their various levels. All right, Christopher, I got another question for agency, on agency for you. I told you this was fascinating. And once you turn <laughs> over this it's rock. It's popular today. It's because it's a really, 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 really valuable way of understanding not just history, but the world. I mean, I, like, not, I, I'm, a, I'm an evangelical historical thinking skills person. Like, this is how you make sense of the world, is understanding these interlocking patterns of agency. Okay, Ashley, shoot. All right. So, from Frank, you explained it as leverage and power. So the mm -hmm. leverage and power of, this, of a primary source, or is it the subject of the primary source? So Paul Revere's Boston Massacre etching, is that the agency of Paul Revere and his bias against King George, or is it the agency of the American independence movement? So I, I think it can be both. You know, like can be a wave or a particle, depending on how you're thinking about it. Um, and certainly the the physical document is an expression of Paul Revere trying to seize agency because he's sending those things out. So if, if we were back in 1770, the document itself is kind of a tool that he is using to amass some power by stoking outrage. Um, but I also think as historians that, that generally it's a, the, the primary source is a reflection of the power or leverage of the moment that produces this thing. So uh, it can be the proof of the of the agency itself sometimes, uh, particularly if you're in the moment. So, you know, in, when John Lewis is crossing Edmund Pettus Bridge, the night that brought that transmission goes out, you know, that's the agency, right? It's flowing over the airwaves. That's the power is being beamed into all of these hundreds of thousands of homes. When we go back and look at those things, um, we're looking at those as kind of the artifact of the agency or the evidence of the way agency was expressed. So it wasn't just that John Lewis had his skull fractured at the hands of you know, the uniformed representative of the state, but also that so many people saw it. And so many people saw it, like you could not argue that this was a group of you know, vandals or lawbreakers, or, you know, th th it's, a, it's a group of people dressed in their Sunday best, humbly, peacefully walking across uh, a bridge. And that was obvious to everybody. And that this goes out into the world in a moment where Americans are, are putting out ideas about what they represent and are now confronted with evidence that the, the reality of the, the way life is lived in large parts of the country do not match up with that representation. So, so it, it can sometimes be that the tool or the, you know, the, the, the line through which agency flows. But a lot of times we're looking back at kind of the artifact of agency and we're kind of using the primary source to say, where, what can I see in the way power is flowing by looking at this source? All right. These are great, like, the, you know, these are questions to, to ask when you're in your doctoral program in history. I mean, this is, you're thinking at a very sophisticated level, all of these questions, which is great. I mean, I, I think one of the, the great lies that, of the way we used to do history where it happened in the sh you know, kind of behind a curtain and you never saw how it was done is that you know only a select group of people can think like this everyone can think like this and everyone should think like this this is this is this kind of healthy skepticism and rigorous ways of understanding the world this is what's going to save us all right i'm going to end on this last question uh, Make I, it a good one. I am waiting for feedback on one other question so um right. jonathan check your inbox and if you if I can't get it in at the last minute, I will get it to who it needs to go to. I just need clarification on it. So, but the last one, 
from Frank. It's a history nerd question. Go for it. We do those too. <laughs> do we know who at the FBI wrote that awful letter to MLK? And do we know if the letter was authorized by J. Edgar Hoover and Attorney General RFK? Uh, great questions. In fact, in the bibliography, we've linked a, a story in the New York Times, which has the whole background. So it's a it's a, a high level functionary, but not Hoover. Um, it's unclear, as I, as I understand it, that document hasn't been processed yet. So it's still in the collection, and they let this researcher look at it and and make a reproduction of it. Uh, but for some reason, it hasn't been. I don't know if it hasn't been declassified or it just hasn't been accessioned yet. Although I would think they would fast track it. Uh, but you can read the whole story. It's not super long, but it'll tell you all sorts of um, fascinating things about that. I don't know if there's any evidence that Hooper himself um, authorized that letter, or kind of looked over it and said, yeah, it looks good. I don't think that there's any question that it was broadly consistent with the message that Hoover was putting out every day for more than 20 years about how the FBI ought to be used and how the FBI ought to try to check um, social movements. So while I don't, I can't say for certain that, uh, you know, Hoover kind of went over it with a marking pen, and I suspect that he didn't. Um, I can also say that the person who did write it and send it out um, assumed that his boss was going to be real happy if he found out that it got out. And, uh, you know, and that he was not like putting his job in jeopardy and kind of saying, I'm going to send this to Dr. King, but Boy, I hope the director doesn't ever find out because it'll it'll be my job. And then, you know, there's this other question that comes out of that again, using this so jumping off point rather than any point. How did J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI get that much power at that point? And we're acting as a kind of unchecked branch of the federal government with minimal oversight from four different presidential administrations. So that's a big agency question that goes off when you're reading that, aside from all of the things that it has to do with civil rights movement, just how on earth did they get this much power? How did they keep it? Um, and then how did they use it in these ways that are, you know, official and, and transparent, but also like semi-official or unofficial and not at all transparent? And what does that mean about the historical moment? And then we're off and running. All right. I'm going to stop us there. I want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Christopher Hamner, to Ashley DiBraccio for joining me today um, and for our second of our webinar series. Please take a minute to go to tinyurl.com slash NHDHA21. Um, and a huge thank you to the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources program, who has made this entire program available to us and given us the ability to think create and present these materials so and to use all their amazing sources because it's oh we talk about the rabbit holes we got we got pinged for the Ooh. rabbit hole thing last oh. time but man there's so much good stuff you really have to pick and choose what you want all right i'm gonna pause here and i'm gonna stop our recording